Yeah, document everything. Document everything. If you worked on a huge feature that launched in production and it led to this kind of impact, document that. If you gave a talk, if you wrote a blog post, if you mentored a team member, if you interviewed, those are all performance-based responsibilities or contributions that you've made. Hey, my name is Felix Tia. I'm the host of Coach of Code, where we invite experienced and successful leaders in the tech industry, from software engineers to engineering managers to product managers, to invite them on to share exactly what they've learned about growing and succeeding in their tech careers. In today's episode, we have Tiffany Jopcha, engineering manager at Autodesk and also a career coach. Tiffany has navigated various roles and environments from information systems researcher to leading professional services at Red Hat. Her journey has taken her through exciting realm of startups where she contributed to transform a company into a unicorn. Along the way, she has also coached individuals through their tech career transitions and leveraging her expertise to guide them all along the way. Welcome, Tiffany. Thanks, Felix. Hi, everyone. Yes, excited to have you on. And you mentioned that you got into the software engineering career through gaming and designing graphics. Tell us more about that background and how it led you into your career. Yeah. I think a lot of people can relate to spending time alone, especially in the last couple of years. And gaming was one of those things for me. And it was really cool because once you start to get really into it, you get to build your own world. And that was a big thing for me as a kid. And that's what got me into graphics design. And I would always spend my time on the computer. That was one way of me really getting to express my creativity and express myself. And that's what eventually led into all this today. Yeah, it's interesting. I think back when you are younger and you're doing all this stuff, sometimes it feels like a waste of time. Maybe your parents or other people think it's a waste of time spending so much time on the computer, but it's certainly shifted these days. So when you were thinking about your future career, maybe going to school, what to study, did you always know that you'd end up in either some kind of software engineering role or an engineering manager type of role? Talk to us through that transition for yourself. Yeah, no, I never imagined it. I thought that I was always going to go in some kind of creative field into business. And, you know, when it was time to go to school, I was like, well, I don't really know what to pursue. What's not going to be the broken artist path? And I thought engineering was the best option because it was one way to, you know, have hands-on experience, build things. I was like, that'll be great. And then, of course, you go through the academic program and, you know, a lot of it is theory. And I was always interested more in the hands-on kinds of things. And I kept focusing on my career and doing internships and being a part of this and that and everything else. I think it was interesting to see how chasing my interests ended up bringing me to where I am now in my career. Because you always think like, okay, well, you know, it's this thing, like, I want to get into this space or like this kind of role or be super cool to work at this kind of company. And then you get there and you're like, well, My expectations were my expectations, but the reality kind of sets in, right? And I think it's always really important in that sense to continue taking your goals and what we want. You know, even if it's a fantasy life, there are themes and reasons for why we want those things. And I think one of the best things that you can do early on in your career is really build that story and build that up for yourself. Even if that doesn't currently reflect your reality today, that's how we bridge the gap is we take action on those things. Yeah. And you mentioned that you credit a lot of your career success to focusing on the strengths that you have and also just like a pursuing or following your curiosity and your passion. And I think when you have these expectations and there's that gap, that's pretty painful to kind of sit in that gap and recognize you're here, but you want to be there. You're not there yet. Was it easy for you to kind of see the steps that are that were required for you to take to eventually get there? Or how did you, I guess, discover that was it one step at a time? Or did you have a methodical game plan to get there? Yeah, yeah. I love that question because it is really hard. And for anyone who's experiencing that right now, it can be really soul crushing. There are a lot of instances of people leaving tech because it wasn't what they imagined or, you know, leaving their careers because they're like they're heartbroken and they leave their careers heartbroken. And that is that is a very unfortunate thing. And it takes a lot to really understand, like, okay, this is where I'm at. This is the path that I'm on right now. If I were to follow this path, this is where I'm going to go. This is the path that's been set out. Do I want to now take a different path, even if I don't know where it's going to lead me? Or do I want to continue moving on a path that's already defined, right? So there's a couple of options when you're in those kinds of situations where you're like, well, I can stay and keep what I have right now, or I can 
give it up for something potentially different or better, right? And I think the biggest thing is being able to acknowledge that situation when it comes to that. Because again, if you're in a horrible work environment or you got the dream career, but it wasn't really what you wanted and it, it turned out like this is not where you want to be, the environment's not great, why you're doing the work doesn't matter, it doesn't align with you anymore. The people, you know, it's always the who you're working, who is, what you're doing and why you're doing it, right? And if those things don't fully align, you have to be willing to let those things go. I think when, let's say last year, a couple of years ago for the last like five, 10 years, when you are ready to kind of make those switches, the market is much more fluid for you to say, you know, I don't like it here. Let me look for something else. And it'd be pretty easy to, or easier to transition than it is today. And, you know, if someone's watching this in the future, this is 2023, where we have strings of layoffs, the market is frozen. I guess what's your advice here? Is it just to kind of hunker down, wait it out? Or if you are in a situation that you're not a fan of, whether it be because you're not a fan of the kind of work you do, the kind of culture, and you want a switch, but then you're fearful of what the environment is like out there. I guess what advice do you have for, for someone in that situation? Yeah, I my advice just from an in, intuitive standpoint is don't move from a place of fear. And it's very common in careers as well to be like, well, I don't have enough experience or I have to do all of these things to get a promotion. Like that's a place of fear and lack, right? And I really recommend people to move from a place of abundance, come from a place of like, I have a message to share or I have a passion in this area or I have really something valuable to bring in this area and pursue that. In your last question, we talked a little bit more about the intuition behind like being willing to let something go for something better, right? The practical standpoint from that, the practical approach to that is going out there, like putting yourself out there. If that is a value that you have, be known for what you're doing in the world and interact with your community, interact with people, start sharing what you're doing, because that brings you a lot more opportunities than you would ever imagine. And you never know who's watching or who's who's looking for the next superstar, the next you, right? Specifically you. And I think sometimes it's easy to be like, okay, well, the job market's like this and everybody's like this. But the reality of it is people are still hiring. People are still looking. And if you just happen to be there at the right time as someone's looking and they're looking for exactly you, you've got a match there. It can be really hard to do that little mind shift, right? But catch yourself when you're moving from a place of lack, moving from a place of like, oh, but this and this, but also I have to do this because you don't have to do anything. Yeah, I almost feel like the curse side of the gift and the curse of someone that pursues this kind of career where you're so logical, where you always want to think things through and a very cognitive approach to things. And you're always thinking about what's the worst case scenario, what's the edge case or what's like the bug that I'm going to introduce into my life by pursuing this. And sometimes I almost feel like the less you consume about almost like the general sentiment about the world, about the job market the more you kind of move from more almost like an authentic place where you are making the decision and not so much in, impacted by the external fears that are being fed to you. Do you have any advice on that? You, one entire world is kind of talking about uh, how there's doom and gloom, whether it be hiring freezes, whether it be the fear of like AI taking over jobs. And this is like nonstop in the media. Do you just cut that out? Or like, how do you make sure that you are able to almost like check that at the gate before it comes in and infiltrates your mood and your attitude about how things really are. Yeah, I do. I always do an audit of my feeds. Personally, like what you consume matters, right? It essentially makes your mind, your thoughts, create the emotions, create the beliefs, beliefs create your reality, right? I also understand like in our industry, metrics matter. There's a lot of engineering sentiment that's like, yeah, you, the metrics matter, productivity levels, like numbers, how long you've been in the industry, those things matter. Whether or not they truly, truly matter, that's up to you to decide. And I always try to say that, like, measure what matters. There are a lot of pitfalls where you can kind of fall into of like, oh, okay, I'm building my resume. I need to have all these numbers, but they don't mean anything. And then same thing in leadership, like in management, we count all these numbers and we do these reports, but we still don't understand what the problem is. Like, there's so many things in this industry that feel like, pitfalls, especially when it comes to science. We're like, how do we measure this? Like, we don't really understand. Yes, we could measure it, but like, would it really lead to this and that and this and that? And I think a lot of times we're so focused on how something is supposed to look like, oh, I'm supposed to look like I have five years of experience or 10 years of experience or 20 years of experience, but I don't have that. You know, like reality of it is you don't need to have that, right? 
it's not important. What's important is you know how to do the job or you know the core concept or the fundamentals that'll take you there eventually. Time is just the box. The number, the number is the number. You either have it or you don't, right? And I, I think that's the reality of it. Like how much it matters to you, whether or not you, you do have it or you don't have it, that's up to you to decide. Yeah, I hear the career coach side of you coming out when you talk about that. So I want to talk about that. How did you discover this side of you that is interested in career coaching? Yeah, I have always been interested in personal development because it's, I think everybody can relate. Like it's difficult to put words to emotions. It's difficult to express how you feel. And those are the kinds of things that I've always researched, looked into. Like my Google searches consist of like, what does it mean when you go into this kind of situation and like you feel this type of way, you know, like those kinds of conversations. I like having those kinds of conversations so that eventually led into like listening to a lot of podcasts and reading a lot of books. And then I started getting coaching and management. Or even in professional workplaces, you tend to get like the opportunity to participate in trainings with like either professional or personal trainings where you'll go through a workshop and that sort of thing. And I would always go to those and take notes furiously and ask really intuitive questions and even just personal questions of like, okay, how did you get into this role or like what led to this? Because I, I wanted to understand those things. So yeah, once I started getting coaching, I just got super hooked on it. And I started joining coaching containers, different communities of coaches. Um, and on the side, I was already helping people. Like I was helping my own community. I was helping my friends, my family, land jobs in tech, like really get it perfect, yeah. like get the system perfect. Yeah, and I'm sure you probably get like a very common question that you get that maybe reveals that they might be coming at the, let's say their career from a, the wrong perspective. Do you find that people come to, let's say, come to you for career coaching or just in general, people that are looking for coaching, they might be coming to you and say, hey, can you help me with my resume or what do I do by trying to get this kind of job? Like, is there a common kind of question that you find like, you know, that's just like not the right question to be asking for you to achieve your goals? Like, I'm not sure if that question <laughs> totally makes sense, but like, I almost feel like when someone has like a problem they want to solve, they usually are so hyper-focused on the problem that they're not seeing maybe like the Bigger adjacent picture. problems. Yeah. 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 Big picture, yeah. Yeah, um, I think it comes up often, but as a coach, you're really there to help people from point A to point B, right? So understanding where someone is currently and where they want to be is really important because sometimes, you know, you get into a situation where you you think, okay, this person could potentially be a client or this person could potentially be my coach, right? And you have to really understand like, oh, is this person going to be able to unlock those perspectives? You know, at the end of the day, the client or the person looking for coaching, the coach like shows you the door, but you have to walk through it, right, on your own. And what I do in those situations is I'll provide the guidance if that's in my wheelhouse, which for resumes it is. And other times you're also supplementing that journey as well. So once they get to point B, laying out the options can be really helpful. So like, hey, you know, once you've built out your resume, if you're getting responses with your resume that for the job applications that you're applying for, you're on the mark. Like, let's get on to the next steps, right? Or these are the potential next steps. And this is how your resume can help guide you through those, right? Because you take it along with you throughout the entire interview process, right? And, and other times when you're like, okay, we, we missed a mark here. So let's find out like, where do we need to kind of tighten up? What areas do we need to tighten up? What areas do we need to focus on? Right. And going from there. Yeah. I think what you're getting at too, is that a lot of times people will be frustrated. They can't get a job, but there's like multiple stages to it that you might be optimizing or hyper-focused on the wrong stage. For example, maybe you're not even yeah. getting interviews. Maybe you're stuck at the resume stage, or maybe you're stuck at not having the right network or referrals. Like there's a lot of different steps along the way that I think what you're getting at is that you have to identify like where you're actually getting stuck and not just that you haven't reached this long goal of 10 steps involved. Like which one are you actually need to be to be working on? So for someone that is like let's say a software engineer that's working with you or working with a a career coach, how do you recommend that they become like coachable? What is like an ideal client that comes to you? Like what's the attitude they have? Like, what do they have prepared? Like, what are they bringing to the table that makes them not just an ideal client for you, but then an ideal client for themselves that they're actually going to get value out of this experience? I 100% think it's the accountability aspect because we show people the door as a coach, but unless they walk through it, they won't get the results that they're looking for. And that's what we metrics on, right? Is like the results. You want to work with coaches that will get you results. 
it doesn't matter how much time you, you take to do it. Actually, it's even better if you get the results quicker. And it's always a co-creation kind of process where it's like you get to see how someone reacts to or even just like gets results from what you're sharing with, from them. So I 100% think that if you're a software engineer looking for coaching, know where you want to go and be willing to do the work or surrounded around surrounding it. Yeah, and I'm sure you also spend time and maybe work with them on like why they want to make this transition, whether it be to get a promotion or get to change jobs. Do you find that there's like a big misconception about that process that you always try to nip in the bud early or that you recognize that your clients or other people that are being coached realize after the fact that they had a misconception about this entire process? Yeah, I think a lot of times when we pursue goals or like, oh yeah, I want this specific job or I want to make X amount of dollars or I want to have this specific title that that is the real reason why they want it. And in my coaching sessions, I like to ask more questions about like, well, what does the money mean to you? Or what does the money afford you? Or what does the title mean to you? What does it allow you to do? And those questions or the answers to those questions tend to reveal a lot about someone's values. And I always go back to values-driven coaching where it's like, okay, Maybe the reason why you want the role is because you want to be recognized for what you do. Some people don't want that. Some people are like, well, I need the role because I want the opportunity to be able to make a bigger difference in the world or a bigger difference on my code base or to work on challenging problems. Challenging problems are fun because it gives me the opportunity to express my creativity or even just challenge my technical abilities and build my technical excellence, right? So there is a bunch of different reasons for that. And Th those are all valuable pieces of information that tell me like, okay, what is this person about? And how do we ensure that every career decision that they make and every career move that they make moving forward is based in those values? If you need money to support your family and the people that you care about, and that's how you're going to be happy in life, that's very valuable, right? Because now as you grow your career, you're going to remember like, okay, I'm not just making money to make money. I'm doing it to support the people in my life that are really valuable to me, right? So those are the, the things that I like to do in my coaching sessions, because it just reminds you all the time, like, why do you exist in the world? What is your mission? What is your vision? Right. And as you grow in your career, maybe if anyone's stepping into leadership for the first time, you have to continuously do that. You have to help people craft that as well. Like, especially when it comes to management, right? It's like you have more and more of an impact and you get to <clears throat> expose that way of thinking for others as well so that they can be taking career decisions that are, are aligned with them. Yeah, I like that you start with uh, make sure that you're both on the same page w in terms of their values. And I feel like the answer they give you is almost like this, like attorney client privilege thing where it stays in the safe space for that reason. But I do wonder though, when it comes to, let's say an engineering manager, or hiring manager, or someone that's interviewing you, my perception is that the value, the reason why you want this job, the reason why you want a promotion, it's almost like typically what you hear are much more noble reasons. Like you want to, for some some examples you gave about how you want to improve the code base and you want a bigger impact on the team. Like those are things you hear frequently, but what if someone just wants to make more money because they want to buy a new car or they want to ball out and buy like a luxury car or go on luxury vacations? Like those kind of reasons, I feel like they don't come up, but are they as valid or should you even say them? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, 100%. And oftentimes in management, it doesn't even come up. It doesn't. And what comes up is, what did you do, X, Y, Z? Have you been performing at this level? And that's the conversation that you have with your manager. I think the special thing about coaching is you get to uncover and discover why you do those things, right? And that fuels everything internally that then allows you to make smarter career decisions, have ta more tactical conversations within your actual career, within the professional setting. Yeah, that makes sense. But I guess, how would you coach someone through through that if, like, let's say... I mean, can you say those kind of things? If it does come up, can do you find that that's safe to say? Like if you don't have like a noble reason or maybe the right word is like a, a selfless reason for wanting certain things in, in life? I find that in professional settings, it tends to play better to talking about the performance, you know? So first of all, 100% valid to kick off the conversation around promotions or even career center things because even in management training, they teach you. Your employee or your report 
they own their careers. It's their responsibility to start career conversations. It's their responsibility to let you know what is their timeline or what are their goals. And so 100%, like if you are targeting a promotion, let your manager know, talk to them, set up a call, let them know like, hey, these are my career goals. Ideally, it's in this timeline. I understand if it's not like that, but this is what my goals are. Let me know how I can best reach that point. And they should be able to set like an aggressive timeline or even more a passive one or even one that doesn't mean like a promotion. Maybe you're happy where you are, right? But it lists out the responsibilities, the expectations. And all you need to do is use that as sort of like a check mark. It's very different from coaching where it's like, okay, you know, these are these are my feelings. This is what's going on, all this stuff. And on the other side, it's like rigid. It's checking off the boxes. It's writing down your report. It's like setting up, okay, these are my accomplishments. And now I'm ready to move into this role. What you do in coaching is the mindset around that, right? And then here is like, okay, I'm now ready. Yeah, that, that makes sense about how it's all, it's all like these kind of check boxes or there's like checklist that you have to knock down to, let's say, get that promotion. Do you have a system or recommendations for someone that's going for a promotion and they have this conversation with their manager, their manager has the expectations and they show the kind of gap between where they're at and the expectations, which generates this like to-do list of things to do or to accomplish, how do you make sure that you are highlighting that you are actually making progress and eventually checking off everything on that list? What's your recommended approach for someone that wants to do that? Yeah, document everything. Document everything. If you worked on a huge feature that launched in production and it led to this kind of impact, document that. If you gave a talk, if you wrote a blog post, if you mentored a team member, if you interviewed, those are all performance-based responsibilities or contributions that you've made and look at it from three perspectives, right? Technical, team, and business impact. So from a technical standpoint, what did you solve? What did you deliver? What did you do, right? From a business standpoint, you know, who did you work with outside of the team? How did you really like shape or contribute to why the business exists or your organization exists? And then from a team perspective, What did you do to ensure that the team continues to exist for a reason, right? And that can be, like I said, interviewing, documentation, mentorship, peer programming. It was all great things. So I look at three perspectives like that. I document all that stuff. And then I also ensure that there's a long record of that consistent delivery, consistent accomplishments, because that's the biggest thing when it when it comes to moving from a junior mid-level employee to senior. It's that consistency. You're showcasing how much experience you have to be able to own more scope of a technical project. So you do have to showcase like, okay, this is my momentum and this is now my trajectory and this is what I'm going to be like at that level. And usually what that means is if your manager doesn't do this, some managers don't do this. Um, if you have an engineering ladder, look at the and the current expectations for the role that you're at now and then look at the level above and the level above that. So look two levels above and look one level below if there's one below you. And the reason why you do that is because the level that you're at, you just want to ensure that you're meeting those expectations. If there's certain responsibilities, certain core competencies, make sure that you're meeting that. If you're pushing very aggressively on a timeline, ensure that you are picking three to four bullet points from the next level up and that you showcase that throughout quarters, throughout a couple of months. So that there is a record when it comes to building out a engineering promotion packet that will be sent to HR and business leaders and they'll have to approve it, right? That's how you get the promotion. And then the reason why you want to look two levels above is because, you know, if you're getting into a staff or principal or senior, whatever the levels are for your company, oftentimes they're asking for things that like will take like two to three years to plan out. So you can accelerate that. I'm not saying that it will take two or three years to get to that level. Like I said, like this side comes first, the coaching, the mindset, believing that you're uh, and operating at that level and then getting to see it in your reality is the second step, right? So this comes first and this comes after. The reason why you want to look two levels above is so that you get a good sense of like, where do you need to be and how do you continue to take steps that meet to that level? So then when you get, so oftentimes this is a pitfall is someone will get a promotion and then they're stuck at that level. They're like, oh, then what? You know? So ensure that ensure that you don't get stuck after you get that promotion by looking two levels up. And that's what I do for my direct reports who tell me like, hey, 
I want to grow as much as possible, as fast as possible. And there are people that are going to be eager with their careers, right? They'll say that. I'll be like, okay, cool. Let me put something together. It'll contain the responsibilities, expectations for your where you are at currently, the role that you're serving in. This is to ensure that you're meeting those standards first, right? And it'll take two to three bullet points from the next level. And then I'll look at the top one. And they're all, like, when you keep looking up and up and up, they're all, it's like different levels of mastery. So what does that look like for the projects that they're going to be a part of? What does that look like on a day-to-day basis? That's what I do as a manager and provide examples for as a manager. So if you're not getting that from, I mean, this is additional advice. This is, this is all the sauce, right? If you're not getting that from your manager, ask them or ask the people around you. What does your day-to-day look like? Pay attention. Like if there's a bunch of cards in your or user stories in your Kanban board or in your Scrum board, right? Or backlog. Take a look at it. Like, what are they working on? How difficult does it look like? Measure it, estimate it. For where you are right now, what are they working on? And how do I continue to bridge the gap? Start small. Start small for yourself, especially if you know you just started or you know that you're in your early career. Really focus in on the skills that you're going to be building because those are the skills that are going to take you into the the future work that you now see like all your other team members working on. I, I like the fact that you said that, especially when you get to more senior levels, some of the expectations, some of the kind of check boxes take much longer to develop. So you have to get started earlier. And there's something about having momentum too in your career that just makes it easier to kind of keep things rolling. But what about, there's this concept in some tech companies of like a terminal level, maybe like a senior or something like an L5 or whatever it maps to at your company where there's no longer this kind of up or out. Uh, I guess, process where you don't, you're not expected to go beyond that. If you don't want to, you can just kind of stay there forever. Do you see that, especially someone as like a career coach, as like a death trap that you should never get stuck in there? You should always be making progress? Or I guess, what are your thoughts on people that are happy to right now at a terminal level? Do, where you find that they'll change their mind later and kind of be too late at that point? And you're kind of too stuck in your ways. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I find that terminal levels can be frustrating for people that are understimulated. Because oftentimes you have a terminal level and you're like, wow, I'm passionate about the work. I'm happy with what I'm doing. I'm getting paid to do what I love. I'm going to continue to get paid to do what I love. And I'll find ways to expand on in that area, right? And then there's the kind of terminal levels or the situations that feel very, very stuck and understimulated. I've been told in past careers, like, Hey, there's no more career, career growth for you. There are no more career growth opportunities for you. And for me, I, I think at that moment, I was like, well, I'm, I'm actually going to leave now because I want to be running bigger projects. I want to be working with more people. I want to be working with bigger revenue, bigger budgets, you know. And the reality of it is, yeah, it's just as valid to say, hey, I want to work on bigger projects. I want to go for the next big thing and, and then start the interview process again for that. That's how I see it is corporations are corporations for a reason. They have a mission and a vision and it requires more than one person to work on it. And if you're not continuously evolving, continuously setting a vision that inspires people, like allows opportunities at a company to blossom and really allow people to build their dream careers, then, you know, eventually people outgrow companies and outgrow roles and outgrow where they are at. And they're going to want to pursue even greater things. And that's how we advance and, you know, innovation. And that's how we advance as a society. So, yeah, I I hope that adds additional color to anyone who may be experiencing something like that. It can be scary because you're like, whoa, like what just happened? I feel like I was all happy and now I'm stuck here and now I'm stuck and what's going on, right? It happens. It happens. Mm -hmm. Especially when it comes to like career coaching and, and growth, like you grow so much faster. You like. There are times when I'm like, oh, I'm going to outgrow this place. You feel it in your in your heart because you've been putting in the work, right? Like you understand why you come into work. You understand what your values are. You understand what your strengths are. You become a very powerful person in those situations. In for someone from your perspective that is an engineering manager and a career coach, what would you say is it for someone thinking about getting a career coach or just feeling like they should get one? What does a career coach, I guess, offer that, let's say, your engineering manager, maybe or like a mentor at your company doesn't offer? And you kind of captured some of this already, but we would love to hear more about like, why can't you go to your engineering manager to share some of the same stuff that your clients come to share with you privately outside of their you know, relationship with their manager? 
Yeah, I think one thing is a lot of people manage a you know, whole team of individuals and most people don't have the capacity to coach. Other people aren't equipped to coach. And there's a difference between like having a manager and having a coach. Having a dedicated coach is someone who understands like what coaching is fundamentally and is able to get you from point A to point B. Not all managers are able to do that. Most times they're focused on like managing the actual work, the technical work. And that can be a lot. There are also times when it's like, it's not a focus or priority within, or even I would say like a requirement for engineer managers to actually coach. So there are a lot of differences, I will say like, you know, but always, always, always do do due diligence before you hire a coach, ask them a lot of questions. They typically have booking calls where they get to explain their process. If it's group coaching, there's typically hot seat coaching or coaching at the end of the sessions where you get individualized coaching from your coach. But ensure that you're getting what you need out of it and at the level of support that you need. Some people don't need dedicated or even private coaching. Some people just need a little bit of guidance. And there are also a lot of people who go and get mentors or find mentors online and they meet with them for 20 minutes and they get what they need and then they're off to it. So, you know, if you're thinking about getting a coach, you know, like if it's going to be a six month program or eight month program, try to envision like what you want out of it. Have a couple of things in mind so that you get to have that or at least something better. (laughs) It's an investment in yourself, 100 percent. Yeah, for sure. And I'm sure, too, that the clients that come to you when they are, let's say, transitioning careers, looking for new jobs, that there is this interview anxiety that comes with it where they are having a lot of success with you now, they're landing interviews, but now this is like the night before, the day before the big interview at the dream company that they want to work for. Do you have any tips there for someone that has a lot of this kind of anxiety around interviewing, especially like more like technical interviewing for, let's say, software engineers? Yeah, get a lot of practice. And if you have a coach specifically for interviewing or landing a job, ensure that they offer mock interviews because that's the best way that you can attune your nervous system So that you're like, okay, I feel nervous, but also I'm able to talk through and answer questions at the same time. It's okay to feel nervous. Like there are some public speakers who've spoken on thousands of stages, right? And they still feel shakes, jitters, anxiety before their talk and they settle down once they're on stage. So that practice is going to get you there. Also, if, if it's technical interviewing, right, it's almost like muscle memory after a while. You smash out a couple of leak code questions like, your brain absorbs it and then you see it and then you just regurgitate it. And again, it might not be perfect. Like maybe someone says, oh, you didn't talk enough or, oh, you didn't <laughs> you tell me about your thought process enough. And that's why we practice on them, you know, and the way that you practice has to stimulate the real environment and try to get it as close as possible because that's what's going to actually nail it. If you're doing leak code problems and you're eating chips at the same time and it takes you five hours, you're it's not the it's not going to be the same as when you're sitting in a 30 minute technical interview across from potentially one of your coworkers and they're asking you to solve the problem you're not going to be able to like whip out your chips and take five hours to do it so ensure that when you're practicing like set it up like give yourself 30 minutes talk through the problem when you're trying to solve it and that will get you better results than like i said if you're just you're like oh i'm practicing and i'm doing the due diligence of practicing but you're being lazy about it one, one thing about your current role, too, is that as a manager, you enjoy these kind of one-on-one, let's say, conversation meetings or with your ICs or the people that report into you that are on your team. There are probably people out there that are ICs or managers even that maybe dread the one-on-one, dread coming to them, dread having what to say, like how they should go. What's your advice there for someone that knows it's important, knows it's kind of these one, this you know, FaceTime, this like one-on-one time with your your manager, someone that has a lot of impact on your career, but dreads it? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, that one's a hard one. I think we've all dreaded a meeting at some point in our careers, or like, oh, what if I just don't show up, or what if I cancel? But I think the one-on-ones are really, really important. If your manager's canceling your one-on-ones, that's pretty disrespectful. If you're the person who's having the one-on-one, you're like, oh, I don't want to show up. Let me just not show up. That shows equally that you don't want to be there. And I think that's such a waste of like valuable time to be able to connect with someone, especially someone who, you know, 
is going to advocate for you. They should be your biggest advocate. Um, if they're not your biggest advocate, then really think about what do you want to get out of that meeting? Always ask yourself, like, what do you want out of that meeting? Sometimes it's an answer to a hypothetical question. I've done that before where I've asked, like, okay, if you're in this type of situation or take, for example, this kind of stuff happens, what would you do? Or what's your philosophy behind? I remember asking like management questions like, what's your philosophy behind like office politics? Or why do you think office politics happen? And it was really interesting. And you get to hear people's frameworks and thoughts and things about it. And you're, I'm always surprised at the answer. So sometimes it can be like that. Like I, I've had one-on-ones where people are asking me like, okay, well, what is your philosophy behind engineering management? Or what, what it is? So you can really just know like one-on-ones are... There's no set in stone way to conduct a one-on-one. It can really be a conversation about career development. It can be a conversation about what happened this week. It can be about work performance. It can even be about like what's happening in the company, you know, like things like that. So just know that there's a lot of versatility when it comes to one-on-ones. And if it's helpful for you to just prompt that before a one-on-one so that you can get the information that you need or you can ensure that the one-on-one to the best of your ability ends up being useful to you, I think that's the best way to handle them because you have to manage your time. Like if you're sitting in one-on-ones and you hate every single one of them, that's not going to motivate you to make better career decisions when you get the opportunity to, you know, you might just be like, oh, (sighs) these one-on-ones suck. And then, you know, manager says like, oh, there's this really cool opportunity I think you might like, and you're not open to it because you're like, oh, this one-on-one sucks, you know, and you might miss something. So ensure that you manage your mindset before and after coming in or as you're coming into the one-on-ones. I like that. You use it as a space to be asking the questions. I think a lot of people that maybe dread one-on-ones are thinking they're coming to it to be interrogated or to be offering things rather than to use that as their time to pick the brain or to get a better understanding of what's going on in the company or with their manager. And I think coming from that more curious perspective, I think, should hopefully alleviate some of the fear and the dread from it all. I love that you said it that way because... You know, it just goes back to that that first bit that I said around moving from a place of abundance and not from a place of fear or lack. Because like I said, like, yeah, the one-on-ones can be scary. The one-on-ones can be like, oh, why am I being interrogated right now? But this is to encourage you all to get that power back, especially if you feel like you're losing it. Your manager's there for you. Like, there's no manager if they're not managing something or someone, you know, like, so so just know that. And, and yeah, be willing to ask some of the questions. And again, like if someone's asking you difficult questions, ask them difficult questions too. prepare something. I used to do that in interviews. Like, I don't know why. I think like at some point interviewing was just there was just not a lot of standard practices in this industry about how to conduct interviews. So I'd always find myself in these strange situations where people would ask me very like difficult or inappropriate questions where you we wouldn't get that typically in like, you know, the processes that w- would be in place like. You know, if you're talking to HR, like th- those questions won't come up. So I-, I would always, before every call, like have a list of questions that would be pretty difficult to answer, but just give me the same answer. It'd give me the same kind, ca- give me very valid insight into the company. And and if the interview was great and I didn't get any hardball questions, I would just save those questions for next time. You know, I wouldn't ask them. But sometimes when there were interviews that were interviews or sessions that were really bad, I, I would ask the questions, you know? Sometimes yeah. you have to be reciprocal. You have to meet the energy. Yeah, exactly. And I think what you're getting at too is about how by preparing these kind of questions, and even if you don't end up using them, just knowing that in your back pocket helps you take some of that power back. Like you're saying, like just like you are able to, I'm not sure if the right word is like to dish it back to, at them, but like you're able to kind of hold space in the same kind of interview and that you're not just there again to be interrogated you're not there as like a yeah. subject for them that that makes sense yeah yeah and i think a, a lot of times like the people in higher positions of power they feel that it's a little bit of an ego thing right to be able to dish it like make it, <laughs> dish it out to someone else like they feel good bullying their one on their direct reports and one-on-one some people do that and it's horrible right like i said like there the reality of it is some people leave tech leave this industry heartbroken right like that's horrible but that's how you begin to kind of manage or cope with those kinds of situations makes sense and i'll leave you this last question because you are now a career coach if you had a career coach much earlier on in your career what advice do you wish they they gave you Mm, that's a good one 
I think the biggest thing is to own your strengths. When I first joined in my career, people kept telling me like, stop wasting your time, stop saying yes to everything, like skip a couple of meetings, break some rules. And I kept wondering why, like, why do I keep getting this? Like, I feel like I'm breaking the rules. I feel like I'm saying all the things. But I think what they really meant by that is to own my strengths, like let it shine. A lot of times we take a backseat to what we could be doing or what we should be doing. Like we get this idea like, oh, maybe I should do this, but I actually won't because I might step on someone's toes. I think the important thing is to just know, like, there's a reason why you're feeling that nudge. And a lot of the times when you do do those things or you do do the scary thing, um, that's what you get thanked and recognized for. And I wish that in my earlier career, people would encourage me more to do that because it took me a lot of time to really own that and own it, right? Like, if you say that you're the kind of person that wants to be an inspirational leader, if you say that you want to be an excellent engineer, like, that's valid. You know, that's valid. And a lot of times in our industry, we say, like, that's not valid or, you know, you should be thinking about it in this way, especially in management. Like, oh, you should be very rigid or all this stuff. Right. But I'm like, yeah, but in order to be an inspirational, or empowering leader, you have to be willing to sit down and do the hard things. You have to lay out the milestones. You have to go first oftentimes. That's part of it. And I acknowledge that. And a lot of people won't be able to understand that until you own it and articulate it. So. That's what I I wish I had gotten earlier on in my career. Yeah, and I think that I've heard this said to me in a similar sentiment, which is that you're entitled, you're allowed to take up the room, to take up the space. You're allowed to, I think because especially in, in the, I'm not, maybe in other, other industries, I don't even know about the tech industry, but everyone's so opinionated or there are a lot of people that are opinionated and their voices are typically louder. And sometimes when someone's really opinionated, they're loud, they are impassioned by what they want to say, it almost feels like, oh, that must be the objective truth. And I'll just kind of go along with it. But, um, and the kind of, you start devaluing your own kind of intuition, you're devaluing your own like perspective or opinions on things. I think it's important to know that even without someone of authority granting you the permission to exist or to speak your mind or to believe certain things, you were kind of not necessarily born with it, but by existing, you deserve the space. So I think that's important that certainly advice I wish I heard earlier in my career as well. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much, Tiffany, engineering manager at Autodesk and career coach. And that's all the time we have for this week. Come join us next time on The Culture of Code. My name again is Felix Tia. Take care.